Okay, our waiting room is emptying and you all are joining us. Thank you so much for being here for our closing College Day presentation. My name is Britta Glade. I'm Senior Director of Content and Curation for RSA Conference. And it's really been our pleasure to have you here with us um, at RSA, here with us at RSA Conference. We look forward to future events where we'll be able to get together in person. Um, welcome to this job search session. And first off, let me start by congratulating you on choosing, choosing cybersecurity as a career area of interest to you. Um, you've chosen very well. Uh, we're grateful to have you here with us as students. We really look forward to engaging with you um, today in this capacity and in the future as colleagues in this very exciting industry. Um, I am joined today by some amazing people um, who will be leading our conversation uh, today and also um, as, we, as we move forward with our session in breakout rooms. Um, uh, our event will be as follows. And we hope for this to be pretty collaborative. So feel free to use the chat panel if you have questions that you would like to be asking of our, of our speakers today. We'll do our very best job to address those in this conversation or after the fact via, via social media outreach and such. Um, we have Camille Stewart here with us. We have Paula, Sarah, Brent, Christine, Carrie, and then myself who will be hosting the session. Um, I want to not take any additional time from our panelists because we've got some great prepared presentations. And I would like to introduce you to an amazing individual, um, Camille Stewart, who I'm happy to call a friend and a great um, ally and leader in the cybersecurity industry. A quick search on Camille and you'll find an amazing resume. Um, among other things, she's the global head of product security strategy at Google. Um, she's also the co-founder of a very important campaign called Share the Mic in Cyber. I'd encourage you to look that up. It's very inspiring, the work that she's doing and um, encouraging across our industry. Um, she's also a cyber fellow at Harvard. Um, Camille, I'd like to turn the time over to you. Having some technical difficulties. All right, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm so excited to talk to you all today about owning your personal narrative. As you think about job search and just as your career as a whole, one thing that has proven itself to be true is that you should define yourself for yourself. Um, in the social media era, in an area era where people Google search you to figure out who you are, what you're about and what you do, owning that narrative, taking part in curating and crafting that narrative is an important part of your professional journey and an iterative process that will continue to evolve over your career. Um, and so it'll take some introspection. It'll take you know, a lot of self-awareness and one thing you will see if you if you take a moment to look at Share the Mic in Cyber is that visibility and platform can change a lot for a practitioner. Um, so I want you all to be very intentional about how you build your professional narrative and then how that bleeds into your resume and into interviews that you conduct um, and think about who you are and what you bring at all stages. And so I do that in, next slide, I do that in three phases. I think about it as do, validate, exude. And there are a bunch of parts to do because that's that introspective part and it'll be really important. And then we'll move on to talking about how you validate that and how you make sure that you are living the, the things that you have outlined. Next slide. So how do you craft your personal narrative? This is where we're gonna start. Next slide. You're gonna think about this in parts. It is a, a lot to comb through everything that you've done who you are, the things that are important to you. And so I've broken it down into a few exercises that'll help you think about where you wanna go, who you are, um, what is important to you, the skill sets you've already developed and the ones you wanna develop. So we're gonna start by reflecting on the interests and experiences you've had. What do you wanna do? Why do you wanna do it? What's important to you? And write down descriptions of both of those things. So both the internships you've had, the jobs you've had, um, experiences that are important, and even take some time to write down future opportunities and what those look like that you would like to have. And then look through that for themes. Some things that are really important as you think about doing that is don't reduce the valuable experiences that you've had. We often, um, oversimplify things that sound commonplace or normal. The fact that you were a manager is not that simple. The fact that you were a receptionist is not that simple. 
And experiences that don't necessarily align with your future goals don't mean that you didn't develop skill sets that are directly relevant. Transferable skills are a real thing. And you should make sure that you're conscious of how you were using your time and talent in the roles that you've had to cultivate those transferable skills and make those linkages for folks as you talk to them, whether that's in an interview or on your resume. Um, and as you think about the experiences, flush them out. Really think about what you were doing, to what end, why those things were important, and then to do some work to prioritize them. The benefit of doing that work is you've done a lot of real deep thinking about who you are and what you want. And you can pull from that three to five words that are essential to your professional narrative. Whether that's the fact that you're an advocate, which is an important word for me. I'm also a lawyer and I'm a security practitioner as well as a privacy practitioner. Um, those things tend to be central to my professional narrative, as well as the fact that I'm a, I'm a strategist and a problem solver. So I, I pulled out some things for me that were really important, not only in terms of what I was interested in, but the demonstrated skill sets that I had. Next slide. I wanted to pull out an example of this don't reduce, um, and keep clicking this slide, don't reduce the experiences that you've had. So someone said, I took a month off to paint my mom's home. That's, that's not something I can put on my resume. Is that true? Is that really true? Next, click on, yeah. Think about what you really did. You successfully led a residential enhancement project, end-to-end, -end, including the scope, budget, cross-functionally collaborated with vendors and clients and stakeholders to ensure that the deliverable was met in a timely manner and under budget. That's a much different explanation than I just took a month off to paint my mom's house and is not fabricating anything. It is just a more detailed description of what you did in the terms that are relevant for your audience. So if you're interviewing for a job, if you are thinking about your resume, they want to understand your project management skills. They want to understand how you work with stakeholders. They want to know if you've had experience with a budget, how you manage your time, how you document things. And much of that you did in this experience, but you reduced it to just, I painted my mom's house or managed the painting of my mom's house. So I challenge you to really think about how you're crafting the narratives around your experiences before you get to the writing of your overarching personal professional narrative, or even writing your resume or writing, you know, a cover letter or anything like that. Next slide. So you've done the breaking it down. You haven't devalued your experiences. You're really thinking through what you did, why you did it, and the benefit that was derived from it. And you can use that to start to craft an overarching narrative. The narrative should highlight your strengths, not only the things you want to do, but the things you're just good at, right? Problem solving is something that I'm just good at. Uh, so whether or not it's my favorite thing to do, I, you know, I'm, I'm a good person to call in in a pinch. Um, and then speak to your career goals. Where do you want to be? Speak to the skills that help you get there. Um, and then run it by friends and colleagues. If you've got people who have seen you in action, whether that's in an organization or at another job or at an internship, either read off your description to them and ask them if you've captured everything or just have them describe you to you. Sometimes hearing about yourself from other people who have observed you working can be extremely valuable because we're often really humble about our own experiences or we reduce them and, and oversimplify them. This is an opportunity to see yourself through someone's eyes. And you often are surprised by just how much people have picked up about your skills and talents. So let them, let them uh, pump your head up a little bit, right? Let them tell you where you're great. Next slide. Another piece of thinking through this is about intentionality. So you've crafted this overarching narrative that tells who you are, what you're about. And then you can use that to cultivate a elevator pitch. So something that's really short that just you can spit out on the, at a drop of a dime, something that's a little bit more tailored to a situation like how you talk about yourself in an interview. So you're talking about it in the context of the role um, or how you talk about it with a stakeholder or peer and provide them context. But if you have an understanding as a whole of who you are and what value you bring, you can always tailor that longer narrative 
to the circumstances you find yourself in. But a big part of that is the intentionality, not only of how you talk about yourself, but how you align branding tools and um, consider other factors. So if you are a professional who thinks that a GitHub would be really important as you seek a job because you need a portfolio, then engage that. But don't start a GitHub if you don't have anything to put on GitHub. Is LinkedIn a mechanism for you to find a job or to connect with your peers and colleagues and folks that you've met through networking? Then do that. Is Twitter a mechanism that is common for practitioners in your space to discuss information, share knowledge, and find new outlets? If so, then use Twitter. But if Instagram is not, don't use Instagram or vice versa. Really be intentional about what you use in alignment with your professional narrative. Now you can use those other platforms in your personal life and curate that accordingly and lock that down accordingly. But in terms of your public presence, it should align to that narrative that you've created. And then, like I said, tailoring that elevator, that overarching narrative to your elevator pitch, interviews, networking opportunities. And then think about how you package it all up. Does your look match what you say you're about? Are you, um, if you're an advocate, are you letting that weave through your work and how you present yourself in your public facing presenta uh, presentations and, and profile? And does your record speak for itself? Next slide. So you've done all this great work. You know who you are, what you're about, where you wanna go, how that all fits together. You've got the social media platforms or websites that align with that. Now what? You validate it. You authenticate your narrative. Next step, next slide. What you don't want is for the thing that you say is your narrative to just not reflect the person that you're describing. You want to live the narrative. The things that you were aiming for, do things in alignment with it. Make sure the things that you've captured are things that you've actually done and you can live up to when called into question. So don't talk about things in your interviews that you actually didn't do. You wanna make sure that if you get hired based on those skills, that you're able to show up and show out in the ways that you described in that interview. So your narrative should be an authentic representation of who you are and you should continue to live that out. Next slide. An important part of that is identifying validators. Who are the people that know that you're as great as you talked about? Who are the people in your industry or even outside of your industry who can speak to everything that you said in your narrative, and that can be pieces or the whole thing, who can stand in rooms that you're not in and talk about your skill set and your abilities and where you should go and where you can go? And how can you better equip them to do this by continue to articulate where you're, what you're doing, how you're growing, where you're investing your time and talent. One thing that's really important is, you know, figuring out how the people in your life can amplify the messages that you're creating. And so if there are people who want to be mentors and sponsors for you, make sure that when they ask you, how are you? You're not saying fine. You're telling them what you're doing. That's actually a great tip in your professional networking and professional engagements in general, right? When people ask you how you're doing rather than a high level, I'm fine or I'm doing well, tell them what you've been up to. What have you been working on? How have you been expanding your skill set? And that helps put more validators out into the world who can speak to the things that you're doing. So you've done it, you've validated it, and then what? Next slide. You need to make sure you continue to exude it. So make sure your narrative is clear in everything you do. Next slide. Seek opportunities to enhance your narrative. Sometimes you even have to build them. Much of my career has been me crafting a role at a company. An attorney who does cybersecurity, who's you know, semi-technical, was not something when I first started out that folks were putting down on a job description. So sometimes you have to find the spaces where you can thrive and be able to explain to people how you bridge that gap. So create opportunities, whether it's at your workplace or in outside organizations, and don't limit yourself just to your nine to five. An important part of creating a toolkit and a brand and a narrative that is all encompassing of who you are is not limiting yourself to the boundaries of your day job. You, 
there's not a, a, there are very few roles where you could do all the things that you're good at or all the things you wanna do. So do some of it at work, do some of it through an organization and do some of it through some other means. So find all of those opportunities to spread your wings, exercise the skill sets you wanna use and cultivate your narrative continuously. Next slide. You are not a stagnant per person. And so your narrative will evolve just as you are. So as your priorities change, as your goal shifts, as your place in life shifts and you are thinking about family or other things, make sure that your narrative evolves with it. Live the narrative that, you know, this is a living narrative that should grow with you and it should evolve just as you are. And so be conscious of that. If that means starting from the beginning of the cycle and really sitting down and rethinking through all of your experiences and where you wanna go, do that, particularly if you're trying to make a big change. It might be smaller than that though. It might be small pivots in your narrative and small pivots in your behavior and how you want to express the skill sets you wanna to continue to cultivate. But you should continue to be introspective and think about what you wanna do, when you wanna do it and how you wanna do it. So next slide. I say all of this to say, define yourself for yourself. It is really important for you to be thinking about who you are in this context continuously. Because if you don't define yourself, you are leaving it to other people to figure out who you are and what you are without your input. And that's not what you want. So good luck as you think about next steps in your job search. Good luck as you engage social media platforms and write your resume, but be intentional about how you pull together your professional narrative. You should be the master of that. So thank you for your time. so much, Camille. Um, apologies for the mousing. I am the human mouse here and some things seem to be jumping and some things seem to be not jumping. So um, as you see, Camille is the exact picture of everything she just presented to you. So thank you so, 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 so much, Camille. Mm -hmm. um, in the next portion of our workshop, and I will encourage you all to please, please, please use the chat window, um, send in any questions that you have in this portion. We are super honored to have three amazing um, HR folks here with you, with us, um, to take us through really the the arc of the resume. Um, you know, sometimes it's it's tricky to know how to succinctly develop that resume, put in what skills you have, what you've done. You, Camille touched on a little bit of the nuance related to that, um, and and how do you best present yourself? So here we have these three uh, HR reps who will, who will talk you through from the other side what they're seeing, what stands out to them. Um, what tips to really help you shine when you're putting together an effective resume. Um, so Paula, Sarah, and Brent are here with us today. They'll also be, um, be staffing the breakout rooms at the tail end of this workshop as well. So you'll be able to have some, some face time with them to ask questions directly. Um, so I'd like to start with Sarah Leroy to, um, to start at the job description portion and how to tailor the experience right there. Again, please use the chat window. Uh, we'll, Sarah will be leading this portion of the session with, with additional input from um, Paul and Brent, and we'll be um, weaving off of the questions that you present to us there. So Sarah. Wonderful, well, Britta, thank you. And I think um, the, the, the very first thing to, to do is to sort of build off of what Camille said, which is that um, you own 50% of the employer-employee value proposition. And so if you know who you are and what you want, then you can better match a job description to your resume, which you've carefully crafted. Um, and one critical thing is don't try to be what you're not either and what you don't feel authentically because that comes in, it comes through. So um when you're looking at a job description, I think it's it's really important to parse it down to, it's, it's, I look at it like a game. It's like, okay, what are they looking for? And how do I match who I am with what they're looking for? So, um, you know, it's, you're passionate about technology and creative problem solving. Okay, you have a solid foundation of software development knowledge. You're pursuing a degree in this, that, and the other thing. There are a couple uh, elements to a job description. Um, 
first of all, they're not always written this, this charmingly. Sometimes they're really boring. But what you have to look at them and say is, all right, what is the overall, step back and look at what is the overall company feel? What are the values? What can I, what can I glean and ascertain from the company by looking at their website? Then when you look at the job, um, uh, let, let's, let's say it's you know, a software engineer. Then when you look at the job description, you match that up to the skills that you know you have. I've learned this particular software. Okay, that means I can solve problems. It means that I'm interested in computer science. Anything, again, bouncing back to what Camille said, anything that you do in your free time, try and diagram it. Um, many years ago, when I was first learning how to write, they did something called diagramming sentences. That's what I do with a job description. Diagram the job description, print it out, put it on your tablet, whatever it is you need to do, and highlight the things that either spark sort of inspiration and energy um, in you personally as you're sitting there and reading it, and then tie that to your resume or experiences that you've had. Um, I think the, and I'm just gonna put one sort of um, statement out there for, for, for the women in, in, in the room that surveys will tell you that if there are 10 elements of a job description um, and a woman has nine of them, she'll say, I'm not qualified because I don't have the 10th. And for the men in the room, they might be only have one of them and they'll say, I can do this job. So neither are bad, but you should know sort of what our internal biases put in front of us when we're looking for jobs. So I would also say, be very self-aware in what you do have and what your skill sets are but don't be afraid to go for it because it's a first time for everyone sometime for every job no matter how high up the ladder you get um so specific specifically tie what the job description says to the elements in your resume or what you think you need in your resume to um to create bullet points and energy in your resume that match so that when the recruiter is looking at it or a hiring manager is looking at it, they don't have to interpret your resume. You're taking specific language and you're putting it in your resume. So they go, oh, this person has a solid foundation of job development. Recruiters don't say, hey, they read the job description and just copied the resume, you know, copied into their resume. And I suggest you don't do that explicitly, but you you should be curating resumes for specific roles, not just have one standard resume that you use for everything. Um, and Brent, Paula, is there anything that you would add to this as we're talking about sort of the job description element? Paula looks like she might have something. Those are, those are all great points. I think it makes such a huge difference to you're really studying. You're studying, you know, that job description and it's all about preparation. So those are all great points. You want to make sure you're paying attention to, you know, the details. Yeah. And and the, the detail actually is really important because when I say following Camille's advice of curating your resume for each role, um, you should also save all your old resumes because you never, first of all, you always wanna know what you've said before because the internet is forever as we all know. Um, and the second thing is that um, you're gonna have language that works beautifully in one resume and then you've shortened it or changed it for something else. And if you can't ever go back to your, your sort of source code, if you will, um, you're losing an opportunity to make your life easier. Um, the other thing I would say when you're looking at a job description is really try to, and, and this goes for interviewing, which is really not what I'm supposed to be talking about, but you should always be in the mind of what problem are they trying to solve with this job description? What, what, what is the role going to do for the business? Because it's not just about you getting a job, it's about what can you do for them? So it's really important in your resume to make sure that you're tying, that you're highlighting what you can do for them that's going to solve the problem. There's, um, it's, you know, what's the job to be done? If you can parse out through the job description what 
what's the do- job to be done, and then tie that to um, sort of the character and culture of the business, and you can weave that into your resume, you are 90% of the way there. And then you just have to show up as your authentic self. Um, so I'm just going to check and see if there are any questions in the chat. Looks like there are a couple there. Um, one, one thing that I also want to say about job descriptions, don't get overly focused on if you don't have something, you know, sort of coming back to what I said earlier, if you don't have something, then that's when you want to go through your list of your volunteer activities. That's when you want to go through that research paper that you wrote or that project that you worked on so that you can say, I have been an innovator. I have collaborated. I have done this, this, and this, and here's how. That may be something you want to highlight in a cover letter because it might not come through entirely in a resume, but there's there are there's more than one way to tie the job description to your resume, to your cover letter, to your LinkedIn profile. So they should all weave together and present sort of one holistic package. So I'm gonna pass it to either Paula or Brent for the next slide or pause if there are any questions. Brent, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Fantastic, thank you very much. And again, um, be, feel free to use chat for questions now or capture them to take into the rooms later. Um, Paula, you will be next to take us through, um, what does that resume review look like? Okay, great. Well, I am so excited to be here. Um, so resume, what is a resume? Um, first and foremost, it is your professional footprint. So you want to make sure that um, as you present this, that it is, um, you know, the best version. So um, Sarah made a really good point of, you know, you may want to just pay attention to what you've created before, but think of your resume, it definitely is your um, professional footprint. And what you're doing with your resume, you are trying to showcase, you know, why you are a stellar candidate, you're trying to promote yourself. So in, when doing a great resume, you're clear on uh, what it is that you want. And also, you know, you're taking inventory of all of your accomplishments. So with that said, you know, with the resume that is here on the screen as a hiring manager and, um, you know, any recruiter will tell you, you know, there really is not much information here in this particular document. Um, when you're creating a, a good resume, you know, there are certain things that you want to make sure that you are addressing. So a few tips, um, you, even though this does look clean and organized, it's very um, minimalistic. So there isn't much information there. So you want to make sure that the professional summary and Everyone has, you know, their pet peeve or the way that they like to look at resumes. So I like to see, you know, an executive or a professional summary up top. Um, you want to make sure that that is not full of any type of fluff. And also back to um, what Sarah said, you know, did you pay attention to that job description? Are you, you know, putting what what it is that you're after, you know, up there. Um, you want to make sure that you have, you know, a section for your skills. You know, is that in a, a list, you know, something with bullets, something that's easy to scan. So again, when you're presenting this, you know, to a company, to a hiring manager, a recruiter, you know, is it something that's easily easy to scan? You know, can they clearly see um, you know, your skills or are things buried, you know, jumbled, you know, do I have to go and search for things? So, you know, having that clean list is, you know, always something really good to do. Do your, um, does your professional experience um, include action words? And again, as I scan this resume, um, you know, there are a lot of words there under that network specialist. 
I am losing interest, you know, by the second because it's you want to have something that's clean, that's easy to scan. If I'm the hiring manager, you know, am I picking up the skills? Am I picking up the experience? Is it something that, okay, I got it, you know, this is a candidate, I understand what they're after, things are clear. So it really is about um, you know, clarity when you're creating that resume. Um, also with, you know, you want to be uh, clear with education. Um, so for me, it really is all about, you know, clarity. Is it easy to take a look at? Um, have you used action words? Um, is it full of fluff, which I never recommend? Make sure you're true to your actual experience when you're, um, you know, creating the resume. Um, other things to be careful of, you want to make sure that you are not um, including any type of bad grammar or spelling errors. You would be amazed um, how many times I have seen a resume with grammatical errors. Um, poor formatting is another one. Um, you want to make sure that the length is, um, you know, one page. If you can keep it at one page, we want to have one page. Um, no manager wants to get a resume with two, three, four, or five pages, and I have seen them, and I'm sure Sarah and Brent have seen them as well. So you're not submitting a book. Again, it's you know a summary of your experience. And um, I have seen them where um, professional summary has been excluded. So right away that, you know, that will throw me off. So you want to make sure you're, you know, addressing those items. Um, of course, your name should be at the top and in bold. That information should be clear, your contact information. Um, what else? And, you know, the professional summary, again, I, I will say, you'll hear me say this again, um, the fluff portion, you know, that is something that I see very often. Um, lots of words doesn't make it, you know, even better. So it just goes back to, um, you know, being clear. Um, Sarah and Brent, is there anything else you, you know, anything you've seen in resumes that you want to, you know, let people know about? Brent, you're on mute. I think to your point about the grammatical errors, uh, nothing negates the statement um, detail oriented, like a lot of grammar errors. Yeah. So, so one thing that I'm that that I notice. So I notice it in presentations. I notice it in 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 resumes. Is be consistent in your formatting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you know, at the end of a sentence, either use punctuation or don't. But but don't mix it up because it, I, I notice it every time, no matter how senior or how junior the candidate. And it just, it's my pet peeve. What I will say, um, and we had a, something of a, a, a fiery conversation around this with Paula Brent and I, when we were talking about this, I don't like objective statements <laughs> because honestly, as the hiring manager, I don't really care what your objective is. I care about who you are. Your objective is to get a job, hopefully with us, and it's uh, you know a match made in heaven. So to me, I would rather have it just be a statement that says we'll use John Doe, even though we don't like John's resume here. Um, you know, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I can't even I can't even work with that one. But you know, basically say you know, uh, detail oriented, co collegial. Um, innovative thinker, um, solving, you know, solving technology problems. Like, I would rather a statement about sort of who you are and how you show up, going back to sort of Camille, like what, what is your um, unique selling proposition rather than what do you want? Because it, it comes back to at the end of the day, we're like hiring managers are looking to solve their problems so they're not looking to solve your problem. The ideal situation is if your objective matches their need. So I would, I personally don't use objective. Um, I would rather you, I do like a statement above that sort of is, here's your USP, but that's, that's personal. So I wouldn't throw out a resume that had an objective, but I think you always have to remember 
what you're that that what you're trying to do is you're trying to have them think that you're fabulous so that you can decide whether you think the company is fabulous. So that that would be my sort of add on to Paula. Sorry. Okay. I'm going to um, jump in with one question for you, Paula, please. Okay. Um, from chat, which is, is page count true for executive roles or people with 15 plus years of experience? Yeah, I mean, we, we hire people at executive levels and, um, you know, they don't hand in, you know, they're not submitting a 10 page resume. I think there's a way to express the experience in one to two pages. And remember, you know, you're going into an interview. So if I have contacted you about the interview, I know up front, okay, this person has 15 plus years of experience. I will be looking for that to come out during the, um, the interview. So there's a way to, you know, summarize the experience in a way that you don't have so many pages. Super. Thank you so much, Paula. Mm -hmm. Um, Brent, we're going to transition to you. So we've talked about make sure you understand the job description and and how to tailor your discussion to the particular job. Now let's look at let's pivot to um, which I think Camille covered very nicely in her session, um, which is creating your own opportunities. Um, Brent, can you take us through this with some interchange with Paula and Sarah as well? And again, audience, feel free to use chat window for questions. Sure. So. I'm Brent Knoll. Um, I work for Walmart Stores Incorporated, and I have responsibility for the engineering and development teams uh, in, incident, in our incident management space. So building your network, participate in events that lend themselves to networking with people in the industry, like security B-sides, or find capture the flag events to participate in and you know, build a team. And these are excellent networking opportunities where industry leaders attend to source talent. Attend industry hiring events. Look for cybersecurity focused events as well as technology conferences. Um, a lot of these have moved to an online format. We've got the Women in Cybersecurity Conference coming up. That's called the Diana Initiative, and it's less than a, the cost of a cup of coffee from Starbucks. It's five bucks and it's free to students. Utilize social media applications like LinkedIn to see who's hiring. A lot of recruiters or hiring managers will post, will post saying, I need this skill set or I'm hiring for this role. And use your connections to establish pipelines for relationships and mentoring opportunities. There are many people out there who want to mentor and give back to the community. And they also want to identify talent and fill roles in their organizations. So I'm going to move on to being strategic. This is your livelihood, it's your career. You want to invest your time wisely and focus on opportunities that are worth pursuing. Do your research on the organizations you're applying to. Read reviews on sites like Glassdoor or look at the list of top places and companies to work for. Reach out to some of your contacts that may, have, that may currently be employed there or have recently worked there. You don't want to start out on a lower rung on the proverbial career ladder than is absolutely necessary. And right now it's, it's a job seekers market in cybersecurity. So here's my most important takeaway for you. You are interviewing that organization and their culture to see if it is a good fit for you and your skills as much as they're interviewing you. Are you feeling a need or are they looking at you as a long-term investment opportunity? If it's not the latter, I would have some serious concerns. If you do not have a lot of work experience, be prepared to use your school projects to answer questions. This works applicable, so use it in your responses. And I'll use the example of like, PCAP is PCAP is PCAP, whether in a lab environment or in a production setting. And this goes for other relevant skills. The best interviews are a good story and it's your story. So, you know, make sure that you're taking time to practice it. When I was coming out of school, the thing that stood out on my resume had zero to do with any of the jobs I was applying for, but I had worked the previous summer as a park ranger for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And it, it was a great icebreaker. It came up in every interview that I participated in. And it allowed me to steer the conversation to the skills they were looking for. I was able to talk about how I was able to deal with difficult people in the recreation areas. 
And it was also something that made me unique as a candidate. I was the park ranger. So moving on to our last topic, focus on the skills that employers want. If you see certificates or specific skills on multiple job descriptions and you don't have them, you may take some time and obtain them. Utilize online training like Udemy, LinkedIn Learning, or Hack the Box. Be able to speak those items that you don't have, but may pursue when you have the necessary work experience. Like the CISSP requires that candidate has five years paid work experience in two or more of the eight domains. This isn't something you're likely gonna have coming out of school. However, most organizations will help you obtain these certificates once you're in seat and you meet the prerequisites. Keep in mind that tech, while technical skills are very important, soft skills are important too and companies are looking for these. So think about ways to demonstrate these skills during your interview or on your resume. Like how well do you communicate? Are you a critical thinker? Can you identify and solve problems? and provide responses that prove that you have these skills. Do we have any questions? I have one that has come in that might be interesting to pull Sarah into as well. So Sarah, Paula, Brent, you know, the, the triangular here. For a recent graduate student, is it recommended to write objective or professional summary in your resume? If yes, what are the suggestions for what to include? So Sarah, you, you might've set us off here with this objective thing. What are your thoughts, experts? <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm a professional summary person, I think. Um, also, the, the reality is over time, you're gonna wish you had more space especially as you get more seasoned, as we say in the business, that you're gonna have had more and more and more experiences and you have to start paring them down. So um, in, in early career, you're gonna, you wanna fill up space. As you get later career, you wanna sort of take out every extra space, half space possible. So I, I would just take out the word altogether and then just use a descriptive series of sentences you know, um, problem solving, globally experienced um, researcher, um, whatever. It doesn't, it, does, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be punchy. And it, it, it's, it's if, you, if you go to a, you know, sort of marketing 101 or you even just Google, you, you know, unique selling proposition, that's what you're doing in the top of your resume. So that's, that's my view on it. But Paula and Brent might have a have another view. Yeah, I, it's it, it's um, basically how are you capturing you know that attention right away with that um, with that summary. So um, I mean, if you're a software engineer, um, you know, enthusiastic software engineer with um, two five years experience, you know, dot dot dot, just you know, a quick summary of um, you know, who you are. And um, then we go into your actual, you know, skills and experience. I also think that's a time, I mean, I, I really, <laughs> Paul, Paulus was really good. I, I, I also think it's, it's an opportunity for you to call out something that might not be obvious, you know, multilingual oh, or, yeah. you know, like, or, um, mm -hmm. You know, if you've lived in multiple countries, that's where you can use globally experienced. Doesn't mean you've worked, but if you've navigated someplace else, or mm -hmm. you know, and that may you, that that works whether you're an expat or or not, right? So it's it's what makes you. It's it's your opportunity to sort of give the banner of what makes you uniquely you, so that they want to dive. They're excited to dive more deeply into the resume. Mm -hmm. Um, Brent, I have, I actually have two more questions, but we have time for one more question um, for you. And then um, for others in the chat panel, remember our panelists will be available in the breakout rooms as well, um, because you've got some excellent, excellent questions for them. So Brent, um, the question for you is, um, what advice would you give to your younger self? Wow, that's a... <laughs> it's a deep one. It is. Um... I think it was, I, the, the thing I think about that when I reflect back on, 
my career, there's been a couple of times where I thought I should say no to a job and I got talked into it. And ultimately I spent three, four years in that role and there ended up being some learnings from it, but the big learning was I should have pursued the, the position that I wanted and not settled. That's excellent advice. Um, thank you. Thank you panelists very much. And again, um, they'll be in the, the Zoom breakout rooms at the, at the conclusion of this workshop. Um, so shifting gears, we, I am very pleased to be able to, assuming I can, there, my mouse worked, yay, um, introduce to you two very talented individuals from Dell who, um, you know, we've talked about the resume now, we've talked about creating opportunities for yourself, so now we're to the interview. How do you best present yourself? Um, again, questions, welcome in chat. Um, Christine and Carrie, thank you very much. Please take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, my colleague Carrie Patrick and I are both from Dell Technologies and are part of the security and resiliency organization there. And we lead the talent management team and are responsible for hiring, internship program, and team member development. Today, we're super excited to join you um, and share some tips and tricks for interviewing, as well as some suggestions for how to prepare for interviews. Starting with the tips for interviewing, um, the first one is practice. Preparing for an interview should be like studying for a test. By practicing, you are better prepared and able to showcase what you have to offer. Um, the more comfortable you are at articulating your background, your interests, and what you will bring to the company and role, the better your interview is gonna go. We have some sample questions that I will go over, some sh over shortly. Um, research the company. Always do your homework on what the company does and be able to articulate what about that interests you. A common question that I like to ask candidates is why are you interested in working for Dell? And I'm looking for or answers that show that candidates have taken some time to look over our website and that they give answers that really reflect on how the company gives back to the community or some cool technology that they really wanna work on and that interests them. Make sure your phone is on silent. Um, there is nothing that's more distracting or really irritating than having your phone going off during an interview. And in addition to the noise, it really distracts you from concentrating and being able to share your story with who you're talking to. Create a list of your accomplishments. Carrie's going to cover this in more detail in a couple minutes, but really take time to think through some of your achievements that you've made and be able to properly articulate those during the interview. Have a list of questions you can ask your interviewer. Being prepared with some questions shows that you are genuinely interested in the role and that you have taken time to craft questions. Um, they can be about the company, the role, or the team in general that you would be working with. Send a thank you. Unfortunately, this has really become a lost art, but you will definitely set yourself apart from other candidates by taking time to craft a thank you email to the interview team. You know, we recommend sending this out within 24 hours of the interview to keep you fresh in their minds. And go slow. Listen to what the questions are and really take time to formulate your responses. Again, be sure to properly articulate what you've accomplished and how you would handle certain situations and really take your time in, in sharing your story. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, here are some of the behavioral interview questions. Um, most companies will ask you a combination of technical or job related questions, as well as these behavioral type interview questions. And what we're really wanting you to do is to tell about a time in your past where you have done something. Um, you want to describe the steps or actions you took in order to accomplish this and share what the outcome of your actions were. An example of a behavioral question is, tell me about a time that you were successful in taking charge and providing leadership during a class project. You want to craft your response to reflect on a time in class that you led your group project. Describe what that project was in detail. Describe how or why you took charge and how that was received by your classmates. And then finally, explain what the final outcome of that project was. Some behavioral questions may be negative in nature and ask you to reflect on a time where you weren't successful. The intent of these is to see how you learned from your mistakes and handle the situation and how you would deal with that differently in the future. An example of this type of question is describe a time when you wish you would have been more collaborative with others. Give an honest answer of a time that this happened. Share the situation, why you weren't collaborative and what the outcome was 
and also take time to share what you would do differently if you were put in that situation again. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Carrie Patrick to take on um, some examples of how to craft your achievements. Very good, thank you. So Camille talked us through some of this already, um, but I have a little bit of a formula, so to say, that you can use um, as you're thinking of things to say during your interview. Um, I would encourage everybody to take like an hour or so and just think through all of the things that you've been through. Um, and in a sense, you're trying to paint a word with or a picture with your words. So the interviewer gets a better understanding of what your skills are and the challenges that you faced. Uh, so a few tips, an achievement is just a moment in time. It begins and it ends and there was a result of it at the end. Um, keep them brief, just two to four lines in length. And you wanna start each sentence uh, with a past tense verb. So something that you did in the past that you completed. And don't draw any attention to specifics like the name of the company that you work for, the product or the location. Um, really the emphasis is about you, it's on your skills. So I gave some examples, like very simply created some Power BI dashboards for capacity planning, 32% increase in the operational efficiency. And so you can see here that this person has taken some time to pull out some of the things that they've done. And if you got that list ready before you go into an interview or now most of them are online, so you can keep them next to you and see what you've done and refer to them quickly. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And last, so we're mostly doing interviews on Zoom now. Um, I think one of the most important things to do is create the space ahead of time and practice it perhaps if you can do the Zoom call with a friend, um, pretend like you're already doing the interview, put yourself in the same space that you're gonna be in, um, dress up as you normally would for an interview, ensure that you're in a quiet space, like go through all of the same motions that you're gonna have to on the interview to get yourself ready. And then have things up on the screen that you can refer to easily, like those list of career achievements, the questions that you have for the interview, just brief info on the company, the job description itself, just make your life a little easier and you don't have to put it all in your head. So I wanna stop there and see if there's any questions in the chat that's come through for us. A couple of questions that have okay. come through, excellent. And you can phone a friend too on some of these, these questions if, if you'd <laughs> yeah. like to as well. And I do wanna let everyone know these slides will be available in the VE. Um, there's some great content in here and they will be there for you. Um, let me start with, is it recommended? Well, here, actually let me start with this one. How do you pivot into information security from a traditional IT role such as system administrator? Mm -hmm. You might want to phone a friend on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, can you repeat the question for me? You bet. How do you pivot into information security from a traditional IT role such as system administrator? Well, for yeah. us in, in SR, in the security and resiliency org, we have a lot of um, more uh, operations type roles that are able to pull in a more generic um, skill set, or if you've had different experience. And then as you get more ingrained in our security organization, um, you can, you know, can just start to fine tune those really specific security skills and get more and more trainings and oper different opportunities on different teams to, to learn and grow. I have a really good one for those of us stuck in stuck in a Zoom world right here. Does it look good if you're looking at another screen? Would it be like taking notes to the interviewer? I think it's fine. Um, it, it, so it, there's no rule that says like you have to be staring right at the camera directly in front of you. Um, and I would like as whenever I'm doing interviewing, I would let people know like I'm going to be taking notes during the interview just to give them a heads up. And if they're doing the same, that's totally fine. I think. Um, as long as you're present and it's clear you're paying attention and you're responding to the questions I'm asking you, it's that, that's really the thing that I care about. Wonderful. How do you feel about the um or long pause in an interview after you ask someone a question? 
I think they're taking that time to formulate, to really digest the question and then to formulate what their response is. So I think it's, it's kind of a staller, but definitely would rather you do that than to either just give a yes or no answer and, and or not answer it. Super. And a final question for you. In an in-person interview, can you bring an outline of your professional summary and questions um, for your own reference? Um, worrying, you know, I guess it's your crib sheet, um, making sure you don't miss out on highlighting anything that you really want to make sure is covered in the interview. How would you react to that? I think it's great. I think to me, it signals you're prepared, you've thought ahead, you want to like, you value the questions that you have and you want to make sure that you get the answers that you're looking for. So I wouldn't expect anyone to hold everything all up in their head. I think it's great if they've taken the time to make a list and prepare. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I'm going to sneak one more in because okay. it's, a, it's a good one. Um, sorry, everyone. Uh, okay. Um, I had an interview with a company that I was deeply interested in. How should I feel if they did not have their cameras on? I was the only one with the camera on. I wasn't sure what that meant. Wow. So they were at the interview and they were the only one with the, can the camera on and then they didn't hear back after the interview? Is that that, the I, that I do not know. Oh, um, it's a, what was it's the a first how, part? It, 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 how should they feel? They're, they're there, they're on the camera, they're oh. showing their face and the other faces are not joining them. Yeah, it, so a lot of the times I think it might be a, Christine, you chime in if there's something different about this you wanna say, but it's a, like a cultural thing. Like some companies, everybody's always on and their faces are showing and it's just this expectation that you're gonna be on video. And then there's other companies where that's not the case. And even within the securities org at Dell, like I noticed there's some teams of ours that are always up on video and then others that aren't. So more than likely it's just a, just a like a norm that exists in that world that they're in. That's really good guidance. Um, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Um, and we've got a lot of people here in the house. Thank you all for being here with us as well. Um, for the next portion of our workshop, um, if we were in person, we'd be moving between rooms and um, have this opportunity to have your resumes reviewed and specific feedback. Again, all of our participants today welcome you reaching out to them um, via social for, for additional follow up with them. But we have the wonderful opportunity today to, um, we're going to break out into Zoom rooms. You're going to be randomly assigned into a room um, with one of these wonderful HR reps um, to have slow, you know, smaller conversations. As you've heard from Camille and Brent really, really emphasized in his portion as well, this network's important. Um, and this is a really great opportunity for you to meet face to face with, um, with some of these great reps. Um, and I know there were some additional questions that came through in chat. Feel free to share those questions there. Um, you're welcome to move into other rooms as well. So you'll just leave that room, you come back into this, into this main area and you'll be assigned into another room. Um, so thank you for being here with us. Please enjoy this next portion of the workshop and the opportunity to meet um, directly with one of our wonderful panelists. And panelists, thank you so much for your time and expertise that you shared with us today as well.